welcome to another episode. I'm Brianne Hendrickson, and here I have Michael Gall from Iowa State University. Thanks for being on here today. Hey, Brianne. Thanks for having me. You kind of hit on resumes a little, and I know that that's a, <laughs> a topic in itself, but you being in the career field and, and that kind of thing... What do we put on our resumes, you know? You do put your internships, but also, if I have another job throughout school, what? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, because, and I can sense the apprehension in your voice because a lot of students are like, what's the right way? What's the wrong way yeah. to put together a resume? Because you hear it from everybody. This is the perfect resume. And I always tell students this. You know what? There's no right way. There's no wrong way. Okay, my three basic rules are simple. Have fun with it. This should be the easiest story in the world for you to tell. Two... Um, make sure there's no typos or anything associated with it. You'd be surprised at some of the things I've seen over the years. And three, make sure you're telling the truth, right? I mean, most college kids are pretty good about that. But when you get out in the real world, I go back to like 09 and 10 when the market really tanked. And I can't imagine the fabrication. So you got these basic rules of thumb. But the ultimate goal with your resume as a student is one simple hyphenated word. You need to be well-rounded, Okay. So to your point, I'm putting the education component to it, all right? More and more colleges. Boy, here at Iowa State, we're so lucky. We've got a great study abroad office here. So you got students that are going on study abroad trips, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, spring break, right after school gets out in May. You can do semester. We had a group of kids that went to Greek uh, the, uh, School of, of Agriculture in Thessaloniki last year there's so many, if you've done these, put that on there too, because it showcases what? Your ability to get out of a comfort zone, right? And and especially if you can articulate, what did you learn in that country versus how it's doing, how are things are going here in the U.S. and articulate that in an interview? That's great too. Then the then the, then the, the work experience piece, which I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a perfect senior level student resume, I want to see all three of your summers accounted for. OK, if you grew up on a family farm, always put that on there. There's so many tangibles with the family farm, the work ethic, you know, um, the understanding of ag industry dynamics, the values that are associated with the family farm. And then, like you said, you know, I don't know if when you were in school, did you have a part time job somewhere? Yeah, I was a daycare teacher and a bartender. <laughs> yeah, I would have killed to have 10 hours of a part time job in college because, yeah, it gave me a little spring in my step on the weekend in terms of spending money. but. And it's amazing how many ag kids, because of their work ethic, when I go to classes and ask them, hey, how many have part-time jobs? Every hand goes up in the class. Um, and what is that? Even even if it's not related to ag, if it's related to ag, better for you. But even if it's not, it sends an important message to recruiters that, hey, this person's got some pretty good time management if they're working 10, 20 hours a week. And I've seen students work a lot more than that to take a full load of class. But it also tells them, I'm not afraid to work. I've got that work ethic, you know. So so ideally, you know, I, those three internships, maybe the family farm, any any part time jobs that you might have here um, are important. And then the fourth piece is leadership activities. All right. That one there always drives me crazy when I'll have a kid come in here and I'm like anything to put under activities and honors. Nope. Um, and, and you don't want to be that person that's asked that question by a recruiter. Well, what did you do? for your last few years here, you know, and telling them study, that doesn't cut it. They, you know, past performance predicts future performance, right? They want potential leaders in their organizations. And that's why these, these leadership activities are so important because they do one thing, they enhance your, your soft skills, right? Your, your ability to communicate, your ability to work collaboratively in team environments, to be a problem solver in, in, in an innovator and all that stuff. And we have so many great clubs, just like every, you know, ag school does. There's so many big clubs to get involved with here um, that you really encourage students to get involved with those things. So if you can add those four things up, academics, maybe throw in a study abroad, really good work experiences, and extracurriculars, your money, okay? Because when it comes to interviewing, everybody's like, oh, I got to have the perfect resume to get, get that perfect job. There's the adage. You've heard it before. Resumes, they don't get you a job. They get you interviews, right? And the more things you can talk about on that interview, the more stories you can tell, the easier that interview is going to be for you, you know, and that's what recruiters want to see. They want to see these experiences and they want you to be able to articulate them and they want to stay interested rather than drawing from the same 
experience over and over and over again. Backtrack for a second. Let's say we did our internship. We've done our resume. We've applied for jobs. It's kind of interview time. <laughs> um, you know, I remember <laughs> interviewing for several jobs. And you do get nervous. <laughs> Very nervous. And you <laughs> want to talk about your your growing up and whatnot, but you also want to talk about your college days. And is there certain things that we need to say to the career people and be like, Hey, this is. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, I can tell the angst in your voice. You hated interviewing it. I don't, yes. and everybody, I tell classes, you're either all in or you're all out. You, you know, the schmoozer types that love to get in there and hit it out of the park. Yep. Right? But the majority are like, you're like, God, do I really have to do this? Okay. It's um, like a test, but in person. <laughs> right. And, and and so um let me back up here's the beauty of the industry that 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 i'm in is that these people aren't there to take your head off i mean they're genuinely nice sir there's people that maybe have an intimidating look like but but they expect you to be a little nervous but they're genuinely nice people that's one of the best parts of my job they're just the great students i work with but just the friendships i've made with recruiters out there that are genuinely good people they want to help you OK, so so don't feel like they're there to, to, to make your life difficult. OK, I want to go back to what you said there. Tell me about, you know, what's the most important question of every interview? That is the absolute no brainer you're going to hear in every interview. Tell me a little bit about Brianne. Right. And the average college student, I don't want to say bombs this question, but they fly through it in 20 seconds. Right. Um, and they zip through it and. This this is such an important question because it sets the tone for the interview. And I tell the, the students that are in vet college, because now a lot of vet schools, they do an interview to get in. We used to do that. We cut that out six, seven, eight years ago here. But you can imagine going into vet school and you'd sit down and be Brianne and there's Mike and here's another Mike and here's another, it's one on three, right? Tell us a little bit about you. And you zip through it in 20 seconds. I tell these students, whether it's vet school, whether it's med school, dental school, PT school, whatever, it's the most important question of your life because what do these people know about you? Probably nothing. They don't have your resume. They don't have your personal statement. Um, they don't have your application because they don't want to form any biases on you. So you need to hit it out of the park with tell me about yourself. So tell me about yourself. I'm going to start off if I grew up on a family farm. Yeah, I'm going to I'm, I'm probably not. I'm a college student. I'm not going to dwell a lot on high school. But I'm going to say I grew up on a family farm wherever. Maybe talk a little bit about your role with the farm. You can throw in. Yeah, like most kids, I was active in FFA, blah, blah, blah. Here at Iowa State or whatever school I'm majoring in this. Um, if you got a good GPA, I wouldn't be afraid to tell them. I take pride in maintaining, you know, 3.5 GPA within a rigorous science-based curriculum. My freshman year, I interned here. So I'm talking about my internship experiences. Um, I'm talking about maybe a part-time job. You're kind of just going through that resume really, really quickly for them. And always close it out with, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Most of these students just kind of go through it. Here's my leadership. Here's the study abroad. And call it quits there. I, I would always end that. Tell me about yourself with my long term goal is, yeah, I would love to pursue a career in animal health sales, you know, or whatever it is you're applying for there. So kind of take it from start to finish. But your goal is to give them something uniquely positive to remember you by rather than uniquely negative, which a lot of students sadly do by just being way too brief. And then really the other biggest piece of advice, two other pieces of advice. One, I'm sure you've heard these questions before because they're They've been around for a while. They're going to be around for a while. Behavioral based question. Brand, tell us about a time you took on a leadership project and you fell flat on your face, right? Students hate those, okay? Um, and but companies love them because they're 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 their best predictive indicator of success with a candidate. Past performance predicts future performance, right? So I always tell students whenever you hear those first five words, tell me, tell us about yourself immediately get that smirk on your face and tell yourself, I know where to go with this. Because a lot of them really are negative in nature, right? What'd you fail at? Tell me about that difficult person you worked at, okay? And your goal is to do what? You turn the negative to a positive. Here's what happened. Here's what I learned. And here's why Brian's a bigger, better, stronger person as a result of that there. But I always tell students with that, you need to make it impactful. It's kind of like that tell me about yourself. They're too brief. You got to show the impact of that. And, and, and so pay attention to details with those behavioral based questions. OK, and then 
the last thing I tell people is this. You got to close out the interview. All right. I, so I'm sitting here. I can look outside right across the hall. There's our interview suites. And I hear kids coming and going, you know, all day long when we get going there. And you always hear that last, well, is there anything else we should know about you? Right. And most kids, nope. And out the door they go. Okay. You want to be able to close that interview out. They always joke, ask for the job. Right. And they're like, how do you do that? Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask some questions, even if they don't, do you mind if I ask you some questions? Okay. And then I'm going to close it out by one showering them with thanks. I want to thank you for the opportunity to interview today. Uh, I appreciate the accommodations that were made. Um, I've enjoyed learning more about company A, B, and C. And based on, you remind them of what you got based on my educational background, my relevant experiences, my leadership potential, my passion for a career in animal health, I'm confident I'd be a, a solid asset to your to your sales team or your sales intern as a sales intern and hope that you take me as a worthy candidate for this. So you kind of move forward with it because especially if it's sales, right? If you can't ask for the job, what indicator is that of you asking for a sales out there, right? And I remember years ago, I had a student come in and um, he was interviewing with an animal health company for an internship, right? And like we talked about, that, those are super competitive interns. And there's 12 kids on the interview schedule. Every one of these kids could walk on water. They're rock stars. This kid comes in the day before. He's like, uh, Mr. Gall, I got to get this, this internship. What do I do? Give me some pointers. I said, you got to learn how to close it out. Okay. And this kid was good. He's a good schmoozer. And so, so he interviews. And th th at the end of the day, the recruiter comes in. They're like, great kids. But we're going to go with Charlie. Okay. And I said, I'm, that's great. I said, I'm curious. Why did you pick this kid? Versus the other 11, they said, because we really liked how he closed out his interview. And I'm like, yes. Okay, but you think about it. That's a sales internship. And if he couldn't ask for that job, what indicator is that of him going out and asking for a sale out there in, in, in some producer's field? So you want to open strong. You want to close strong. And in the middle, you want to just take those behavioral-based questions and, and turn those negatives into positives there. Remember this, Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on the interview piece. Count me out, right? But remember this. Get used to it. Because as a college student coming in, you're going to be doing a lot of interviewing, right? Not only for internships, but leadership positions, scholarship positions, study abroad positions. But just always remember, the more, like anything in life, the more you do, the better you get at it. So, yeah, don't, 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 don't fear it too terribly much. So let's say now they're offering us the job salary, all of that good stuff. I remember my first job coming and being like, hey, this is it. This is your salary. You know, do you go back and say, hey, this is what I want instead? How do, How do you negotiate? <laughs> yeah, and do it. Because, I mean, I can negotiate with my parents perfectly fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when I've got a daughter, too. I know how that's, that, that works. Yeah, yeah okay. but when it comes to money, I mean... I don't want to hear the word no. <laughs> right. You know, how do you, yep. what is that like? It's a great question. And you're, you're spot on. I, I, I get a, every student that comes in with a job offer, it's always, should I negotiate? Should I counter? And they don't know how to do it, but it's really a pretty simple step. And all of us have different philosophies on it. But um, let's back up. Salaries right now, the last two years, crazy good. All right. So we do a salary summary. It's linked to our webpage here last year, which would have been from our December 21, spring 2022 grads. Okay. okay. There's eight sectors or nine sectors in there. We get 20 schools contribute. Um, and these sectors like ag business, animal science, agronomy, all the ones you'd, you'd expect in ag. So when I was crunching those numbers, our office coordinates it. I'm like, I can't wait to see these because, you know, that was coming out of COVID when workforce participation was low, inflation's running high, and I'm like, I can't wait to see these. And it did not disappoint because the average salary increase out of those nine sectors was 8.4%. I'm like, damn, that's good. Okay. This year, I'm like, there's no way it'll, it'll be that good again. And I crunched our numbers for our May grads here, especially on the production ag side of things. And the lowest one in there was up 6.1% again. And I'm like, wow. So our egg business is just under 60,000 average. Um, it, it's the past few years have been phenomenal from that standpoint. But getting back to your question there, 
because sadly, most students, when they get that offer, they're driven by one thing, right? The dollar sign. And you need to look at the big picture. And one thing that I'm really, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised with, because there's an, I tell people, there's another pandemic going on in this world. It's called job hopping, right? I'm, I'm shocked at how many students within one year are on job number two already, okay? Usually driven by, by money there, okay? Um, so you need to look at the big pack, pack picture. And, and I think one of the things that I really enjoyed hearing from a lot of students is why they took that job, because they interned with them and they really liked the company culture. That was so refreshing to me that to hear somebody that's got the maturity to say, I understand this is good, you know, and, and but nonetheless, money is important. Culture is important. Geography. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. There are a lot of kids that are like, I need to be in central Iowa for this job, whether it's a significant other, the family farm or whatever. And you, you just remind these students, hey. That's fine. I get it. I respect it. But keep in mind, you're eliminating 99.9% .9 of all opportunities out there. Your paycheck might not be, you know, the dream paycheck you're looking for. But then you got to look at the whole benefit package. I mean, you got kids coming out of college. What do you mean I can't stay on mom and dad's health insurance for the rest of my life, right? It was me. Okay. <laughs> or or a 401k? How does that work, you know? Or why do I need long-term disability insurance? See, and that's the favorite part of my job. I love sitting down with students or giving talks on that there. So to counter that, and, and the good news is when I look at a lot of the companies that, that we work with here, and I'm sure my peers out there at other schools would agree with me, you don't get a lot of these companies that are coming in and really trying to lowball kids because they know the competitive nature of things. So most of them are pretty competitive or they'll refer to that salary summary that we'll do. I'll get companies call up all the time and, you know, what's going right for a grain merchandiser, you know? So they're, usually pretty good with that there but if they if they feel like countering i always tell them you can't move the needle that much you know maybe you get offered 60 you want 65 you you, you 5000 i always tell students is probably the limit that you're going to do it and so what i i tell them to do is just reach out via email and and people have different ideas on it i like email why because you can state your facts right there versus i'm calling up Brian and saying hey this is Mike, I got your offer, and, because, and you might be caught off guard where you really don't have a lot of time to absorb it. But if you have an email, it's right there in front of you. So I tell them this. I say, point number one, you know, you know, thank you for, the, for the, the offer. I've had the opportunity to look things over. You've addressed a few of the questions I've had about maybe the benefit package. At this point, my major concern is, is the starting salary based on the following, based on one, maybe the financial investment I've made in my, my college education along with corresponding debt loads. Um, two, based on the practical experiences that I'm able to bring to the table, especially if you've interned for them, no denying it, saying based on the practical experiences, especially having interned with your company for one or two summers and able to hit the ground running, that's huge. Uh, three, maybe based on the cost of living in Dallas, Texas or wherever, okay? And four, based on what I see my peers going out at in similar positions. And oftentimes they may even link it to our salary summary there. Is there any way we can move the starting salary closer to 65,000? All right. I know people have different um, opinions on it, but that's, that's a, a strategy that works really, really well for me and our students here. And typically what will happen is you'll get a few of these people that are like, yeah, we'll give it to you. Others will get the song and dance. Nope, can't do it. But in six months, you're going to get a review and likely a little bump in pay. Blah, blah. Most of the time, it's we'll meet you in the middle, okay? And they'll split the difference there. But to your point, like you said early on, it's really about how do I do it and, and kind of having the guts to do it, so to speak, because they get so intimidated by it. But it's, it, it's really not that bad. And, you know, in today's day and age, too, I don't think employers are really put off by it. In, in fact, I would, I would probably – expect a high percentage of them to, to, to see a counter sometimes from students out there. But most in ag are really solid in terms of being competitive. This is something that I hear some of my friends dealing with now. They've had the job for a year or two. It's not working out. It's not, yep. they're not the things that they said that they would do, they're not doing. And you kind of feel like you're restarting all over again. <laughs> How do you go about that? I mean, it's not... Out of college, I can say, well, I'm fresh out of college. Right. And so <laughs> I think, 
if it's not going like you want it to, I mean, I think the most important thing that I, t- I first off I want to tell people, you got to give it a chance. I mean, especially during the pandemic, you think about it, these poor May 2020 grads that that graduated. And I knew a bunch of them that went to work for great companies. And what they do all day? They're doing exactly what you and I did. They sat in front of their computer all day long. And it's not like they need their hand held, but they need onboarding and they need mentorship. And if you're staring at your computer all day, you're not getting it. And so that's where the thoughts start filtering. Oh, man, there's got to be greener grass out there, right? And you start looking for other jobs out there. I think most importantly, you got to give it a chance. All right. Two, but like you said, you got friends that have been out there two to three years and things aren't clicking. Promises aren't being kept. I think the most important thing is you got to have the ability to approach your supervisor or whoever it is and during your review or just whenever and say, listen, you know, here's 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 what's on my plate and here's my concerns right now. And here's what I'm not getting. And 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 express those to rather than just saying, all right, I'm throwing in the towel and, and bagging this job and going on to uh, to another's. And, you know, the beauty is it's a, it is a good market if they don't you know, belly up to the bar, so to speak, with with what they're looking for. There's certainly a lot of other opportunities out there. But with that said, the last thing you want to be is that job hopper out there where you're creating that resume with, you know, three months here, two months here. And wait a minute, there's red flags coming left and right on that. Is this person stable in the workforce? You know, so I think it goes back to everything. It's just the ability to communicate with your supervisor and have those mature conversations. So let's talk about not really job hopping, but like Growing in the industry doesn't always mean staying at that same job. When is it okay to say, okay, it's time to go to the next stop? Yeah. You know, I'm a huge, huge fan of when opportunity knocks, you got to listen, you got to answer. And it goes back to the beauty of this industry. It's so close knit. In fact, I had a young lady in here just before we met and she's, she's like, I need to stay in central Iowa. And she goes, I'd really like to do an events type position you know i want to do um like trade shows and stuff and i and i i I tell people i told her i said if you're doing trade shows i'm going to bet you every cent i've got that in five years you're not with this company after five years because you go to trade shows and what do you do you meet people and it's come work for us right and so you're going to network along the way and if you're good at what you do especially in the business realm the sales realm other people notice and it, it doesn't surprise me a bit where competitors are coming after you in this market to do that, okay? Um, and in in how do you decide to take the jump? I, I guess you got to look at what are they offering you that that appeals to you in terms of the work. Exactly what we kind of talked about before, the culture. Um, you know, the pay is important there from that standpoint. Um, and 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 have that conversation with your, your you know, your supervisor, because what's the, the joke these days, the average person your age is going to have like eight or nine jobs in their lifetime. Right. And so, you know, we don't expect you to stay at the same job all the time, but you know, you just, you just got to, I guess, trust your, your instincts on that in terms of the company's reputation, the people that are there. Do you trust this person that's kind of wooing you to go there? Is this type of work that, that really appeals to you? And you'll, you'll see, you, you know, it's just, we all have that opportunity that knocks and, and there are just times you have to, you have to answer to it. I think of my, my career in horticulture, I love my job, but you know, I, I knew my counterpart here and worked with him closely in that job. And he, I remember him calling me up and saying, that's it, I'm done, I'm retiring, I want you to apply for the job and, and things worked out there. So it's just a lot of times it's who you know in right place, right time with things. But I think ultimately you got to you got you to gotta trust your heart and your judgment on that. So overall, as we kind of wrap up, if, if they could take away anything from this, the viewers, listeners, what do you hope they take away? I would hope, especially if I'm, if I'm targeting maybe prospective college students, this is one of the most unique labor markets I know and, and I'm going to ever see in my lifetime. Okay. I think back, I wasn't here. I mean, back to the 80s when the job market was super tight. And my predecessor was here. He would tell the stories on how tight the market was when in agriculture at that time, how people would literally sleep on the steps of our administrative building here, knowing that company A, B, and C's interview schedule is opening up when he would get here at 730 in the morning. And they'd get in line. They'd sleep outside just to get an, a, a spot on that interview schedule. 
in the 80s. That's how tight it was. And right now, hell, you can't even get kids to sign up for interviews, you know. So I, I tell students when I go to classes, this is this is an incredibly unique time. Do not take it for granted um, just because you have a degree. It's not a meal ticket to a great job. Students that do well out there in the job market, they've earned it. And it goes back to exactly what we talked about with that well-rounded resume, you know, doing well academically, embracing the internships, getting involved um, on campus, immersing in the study abroad, and just putting yourself out there um, because it, it is just an incredibly unique time for, for young people in agriculture. All right. Thank you very much for today. You bet. For premium content, you can head over to the Comstock Report. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button.